And we're back with Davin Salvanu. Davin, welcome back to the podcast, Stories from the River. So, so good to be back here. So, all right. It, it is so, so good. It's, it's so great to have you back. <laughs> We've been having some fun here during the break. Thanks for coming back this week. You know, we, last, last episode, we talked about just your origin story, which is really remarkable. You worked for four great companies. You had, you read Halftime by Bob Buford. You went off on your own with Purpose Point with Kurt David. You started that, you co-founded that. You wanted to share purpose with the world. Uh, you had Northwestern Mutual at their annual meeting. You know, use your, your talk as their keynote in 2018, July, 2018. And then that dovetailed into like sit, sitting around the table, coming up with Let's do a Purpose Summit in November 2018. You had that idea. You launched it eight, late April, April 29th, 2019, the Purpose Summit. And so then you got into, you you know, from a guy who wanted to be a school teacher who didn't, from Philly, who just like uh, Will Smith, <laughs> who didn't read a lot of books nope. growing up, who became an avid reader, you then wrote your first book, Finding Purpose at work subtitled hello i am a difference maker and uh it's got a uh great message here you, you you gave me a great note here this is my personalized copy you wrote about us in this book and you've got a foreword by ken blanchard so i thought maybe for this episode we can talk about this topic and this book finding purpose at work welcome to stories from the river a show in which we go behind the scenes at broad river retail tell us when did you have the idea for this book? How did this book come about? How long did it take you to write it? How did you meet Ken Blanchard and get him to write the foreword for it? Go. Yeah. So that's, oh my gosh, there's so much to unpack there. I never, as you mentioned, I didn't like to read. I, in fact, for those of you who remember Suncoast Video, I don't know if you remember that, but there used to be this place in malls where you can buy videotapes of pretty much any movie that had ever been made. VHS tapes, remember those? Mm -hmm. Oh, I that, that, those. That, that you could buy of any any movie. And there, there was a lot of movies that were titled after books that had been written. So when I was in high school, I used to, we, had, we were assigned summer reading, right? We'd have to read, you know, like To Kill a Mockingbird, Tale of Two Cities, Great Expectations, all these books. And uh, I hated to read. So I would just go to Suncoast Video and I would just get the VHS tape and then watch it and take the B on the test when we got back to school because there's always stuff in the book that wasn't in the movie. So I was not an avid reader and I never thought that I would write a book. Uh, but, you know, I had all these stories and I and I feel felt like the world needed to hear them. And so LinkedIn had this awesome, you know, little feature where you can write an article on LinkedIn. And so what I started to do is I started to write a lot of articles, mm -hmm. article after article after article this on is, LinkedIn. This is in 2018? 2016, 17, 18, okay. really three years leading. And I never thought that I would put them into a book. Or anything. I, I was just writing down my thoughts because they were stories that I felt that needed to be shared to emphasize kind of, this was during the incubation period, that 16 to 18 incubation period we, talk, we talked about yeah. in the last episode, yeah. right? And so that's 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 what that, that was. And so I writing writing all these things and then I thought, you know, I'm going to I'm going to put these into a book and the title Finding Purpose at Work actually has two meanings. One is finding purpose at work in your job, right? How do, how do you identify what your gifts, talents, abilities, skill sets are and how do you use those every day in a way that makes you feel fulfilled so that you realize that you are a difference maker? That's why the the book cover is a blue collared shirt with a name badge that says, "Hello, I'm a difference maker." And that's the idea behind it. But the second meaning and this one's more deep for me is if you look back over your life, if purpose were almost a persona, you could look at all of the different things that happened in your life and see what was taking you to where you're at today. Mm -hmm. And so part of the outline of this book is also looking back at your life and saying, what are all the things, all the different experiences, all the things I've been through, and what was the purpose of those? How is purpose at work in my life to lead me at where I'm at today? So it kind of has a dual meaning. And so... I had been kind of thinking, well, who's this book for and who should I write it for and which, what's the audience and what's the message? And so I, I just shared the two messages with you. Uh, but the reason I shared that last one with you is because even the way that this book came about, how I met Ken Blanchard, all the things that you just asked, again, is kind of, it highlights the finding purpose at work on the journey to writing the book. Let me tell you what I mean. My wife and I were supposed to go to a church planting conference in November of 2018, same exact time they were planning the, the Purpose Summit. And 
she came down with pneumonia a week before that church planning conference, so we couldn't go. And so they had a a, a follow up, a makeup, basically, you will, in uh, Laguna Beach, California, in February. So it was February twenty uh, sixth of twenty twenty that this church planning conference was set up. And so I was asked to go to that. And so I was just going to fly in, go to the church planning conference, fly home. And so I, I tell a friend of mine who had asked me to come out and speak at an event in the previous year in California that I'm coming in and just asked if he was available to get dinner. And he said, well, when are you coming in? And I said, I'm coming in on the 26th. And he said, could you come in a day earlier? I have a conference on the 25th and I would love to have you speak at it. So I decided to come in a day earlier to speak at this conference, then go to the church planning conference. And so then he starts telling people that I'm coming in to speak at this conference. And one of the guys that was coming to this conference was having his own symposium for a whole bunch of investment advisors in Lake Tahoe on October, or I'm sorry, on uh, March 4th. And so I, he said, will you come and speak at the symposium on March 4th? And I'm thinking, I'm already going to be on the West Coast. I'm not going to fly back from this church conference and then fly back to Lake Tahoe. That's just a lot of flying. So I said, you know what? I've been meaning to write this book. I'm just going to stay at the Marriott Cliffs Resort in um, Dana Point, where, where I was staying after the Laguna Beach thing. And I'm just going to write. I'm just, it'll be a writing retreat. So this is my plan. Come in, speak on the 25th, go to this church planning conference on the 26th, 27th, and then write on March 1st, March 2nd, March 3rd, fly to Lake Tahoe, speak at the symposium, come back. And so I'm there. That's the plan. And we had just gotten, uh, we, we had started getting into leadership development, organizational development at Purpose Point. And we had just had a company that we took 100 leaders through Ken Blanchard's signature leadership program, Situational Leadership. And so we were, we were just planning that. And, and Ken Blanchard's team reached out to me and said, hey, um, we have our annual conference coming up and we'd love to have you come and, and speak at our annual conference. And I said, well, when's the annual conference? And the annual conference was March 1st and 2nd in San Diego. And I said, you're not going to believe this, but I'm already coming into town. I'm going to be in Laguna Beach, which is about 45 minutes north of San Diego. I'm going to be there from the 25th until the 27th. And then I was just going to sit there at the hotel and write. And then I was going to go to Lake Tahoe, but I'll come down to San Diego and then I'll just change my flight from John Wayne to from San Diego to uh, to, to Lake Tahoe. So I drive down to San Diego. I walk in the doors for this conference and the people who invited me to come there, they're standing there. And, uh, they say, Oh my gosh, Davin, we're so glad that you made it. And I saw, I'm so grateful to be here. Ken has had a profound impact on my life and, and I've never had a chance to meet him. And I'm just so grateful for his work and how he's changed my life. And he says, well, he just walked in behind you. So why don't you thank him? And so I turn around and Ken's standing as far as we are from right here. And I shake his hand and I say, Ken, I've waited 20 years to meet you. And he says, young man, I won't hold that against you. <laughs> and he's got such a funny sense of humor. And, you know, at the time he's 82 years old and he's got a cane. He says, tell me, have, have you had anything to eat yet? And I said, no. And he goes, why don't we go get some eggs? And we walk back to this table and we sit down at this round table and it was just he and I and we had breakfast together for an hour. And he started asking me all these questions. I had so many questions I wanted to ask him, but I couldn't get a word in edgewise. I, he just kept on hammering me. And he was just so very interested in who I was as a person and my work and all this. And then he says, tell me, have you written anything on this finding purpose stuff yet? And I said, actually, I'm supposed to be writing a book on that right now. And you know, I didn't because I came here to, to speak at your conference. And he said, what you have to say is really important and people need to hear it. Would you do me a favor and send me that book when it's done? Cause I would like to write the forward to that book. Wow. And my mouth just like hit the ground. I'm texting my wife. I'm sitting here having breakfast with Ken Blanchard and he wants to write the forward to this book. And so he offers that we spend the rest of the day together. And then at dinner, he gets up and I sat with dinner with him and he's leaving and give him a hug goodbye. And he, he's walking out the door and he pauses and he turns and he points the cane at me and he goes, finish that book. I'm not getting any younger. <laughs> and he walks out of the room. Now, for those of you who are keeping track with this very long story and timeline, that was March 4th, 2020. I come home, March 6th, the world shuts down. Mm -hmm. 
March 12th, Michigan shuts down. Yeah, it was, it was pretty close to, it was, I think it was around March 16th, Mark, the world shut down. That's right, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. Or March right. 11th. Right. Or, or yeah, whatever it was, it was right, right around the same time. Yeah, and so I then go into my basement for like many other people and all I'm thinking is, oh my gosh, like what happens if I get COVID and I die and I, and I never get to write what's in my heart and mind? What if I never get this message out? What if Ken gets COVID and he doesn't write the forward of the book? What if, what if, what if, what if? And so I just started writing. And so the book ended up getting written in six weeks. Um, just every day I went down to the basement with a cup of coffee and I took pieces from the articles I had written on LinkedIn, stories that I'd done, interviews, the, the, our conversation at Broad River. And I, and I kind of formulated this book. And then, you know, Ken had offered actually, he said, hey, I got two or three publishers that'll publish this book for you. Um, but it'll probably be about two years before it comes out. And he says, Davin, why'd you write the book? I said, I, honestly, just because I feel like it's a message that people need to hear. There are so many people struggling, not recognizing that they make a difference, not recognizing that there's purpose in their life. And he said, well, if I were you, I would go through a hybrid publisher and get this thing out as quick as possible. And so we did. And we went through a hybrid publisher and the book was published in later that year in December of 2020. Wow. Okay. There's a lot you just unpacked there. That was, that was tremendous. Your wife gets pneumonia. I, initially, I, just to pl replay this, I thought it was November of 19. It was November of 18? 19. 19. So you guys were planning the second Purpose Summit. No, no. Uh, yes, that the, is correct. The yes, second yes, Purpose that's Summit. Right, that's right. Because you would already done the first. We'd already summit. done the first. That's okay. right. That's where I Because I wrote about the summit in the book, so that that's makes right. sense. Okay. Yes. Uh, but but y'all couldn't go to that church planning conference, but then you get to go to it a new, a different one scheduled in Laguna Beach yep. in f late February, yep. 2020. Yep. <clears throat> you were, how did the Blanchard company connect with you though? So we had been, I, I had uh, filed to be a, a licensed channel partner of Blanchard's work to be able to continue his work. Okay. And so they had a program for that. And so I was able to write and speak and teach and train as a certified Blanchard coach. Okay. Um, and so we were doing that for some companies and we had just taken a hundred liters and a manufacturing, and a manufacturing company okay. through his program. And they were like, can you, can you please come and talk about how that happened? Uh, that's so cool. So purpose point was going to do leadership development with, with this Blanchard cert certification method on SL situational, SL too. That's correct. situational leadership. That's right. Wow. That's right. Well, yeah, because part of it was, you know, one of the things I had said is you know, we keep engaging and inspiring people on this conversation of purpose and companies are like, well, this is great, but then how do we do it? And so I had studied Ken's work for years and I, I had implemented it at Costco, at Macy's, at CVS, at Northwestern. I had implemented situational leadership at those companies because those companies had applied for that program for Blanchard and then tapped me on the shoulder to be the one that implemented it. Okay. So I was very, very familiar with it. And so I thought, well, we've got this program that I know is a really great program to help leaders step into their purpose and then help those leaders help their people step into their purpose. And so for me, it was just a natural evolution of, hey, beyond just engaging and inspiring people on this message, how do I equip them? How do I help them when I'm not speaking and writing about it? And uh, a friend of mine who was a CEO of a manufacturing company, they had about 700 employees, um, said, where do I start? And I said, well, I got a program for you. And that's kind of how that happened. So that's how they connected with you. And then they wanted you to come speak at this event. That's right. And then there was a symposium at, in, in Tahoe. Yep. Okay. But while you were there, you meet Kim Blanchard. So, and you had not started the book. Is that correct? I was outlining it, uh, right? Okay. I, I was pulling together all the pieces and saying, okay, you know, what chapters, what's yeah. the topics, how does it flow? And, and hi what's hybrid publishing? So there's three different types of publishers. You have traditional publishers, mm -hmm. which um, basically, you know, you put together a book proposal, you send it to them. Uh, these are the stories where you hear people get rejected 28, 29, 30 times by mm -hmm. different publishers because mm -hmm. they don't think that you're, you're, you're you know, I, I think um, Harry Potter was rejected 29 mm -hmm. times before she got that published. Big mistake by the first 29 publishers, yeah. right? Um, so basically you pitch them your book. If they think it's worthy, they give you a deal, but that deal, they then own the book. Mm -hmm. And so then they really take it from there and they print it, they put, they put it out there on mm -hmm. shelves. Uh, you still have to market it. You have to put a whole marketing plan together behind that and you get, you know, a royalty of it. You know, most authors will get, you know, uh, pennies on the dollar for, for their book. And I didn't write the book to make money. I didn't write the book to sell books. I didn't write it to be a best selling book. I wrote it to have it, have a message that people can take to heart and companies can take to heart. So that's traditional publishing. 
Then you have self-publishing, which is the opposite end of the spectrum where anybody can write a book and they can just go to Amazon and publish it and Amazon will print it, throw it up on there, and your book's on Amazon. There's really not a vetting process for that. You pay for that process and you know you basically split the proceeds with Amazon. Actually, Amazon takes 55 and you get like 35 and there's like 20% printing costs. Um, but you know, I, I, again, and I, I wasn't interested in, in just selling a book. And then there's hybrid and hybrid is where you go to an organization and they will, uh, you send them the book, they will edit it, they will format it, they will give you some feedback on it. Uh, they'll basically help shape it for you. Uh, and then they have the same distribution as traditional publishers. So they will have your book everywhere, wherever books okay. are sold That's cool. um, and they'll help market it for you. And they, um, they don't take a piece of the revenue. You pay them for d different packages of what you want. But then you also have to uh, abide by their timelines, right? So you also don't have control of the publishing timeline. So there's kind of these blends of, you know, depending on what you're writing a book for, mm -hmm. whether you want to go. I, now, my second book, I mean, I'm going through a traditional publisher. Mm -hmm. I have a speaking agent and a literary agent. He's an amazing guy. His name's Scott Jeffrey Miller. He's mm -hmm. written seven best-selling books. Uh, he's been with Franklin Covey, and so we're looking at publishers for the second one right now. But, but I went with this hybrid one, and um, and and it became the best-selling book of that time frame for wow. that publisher, um, which was fantastic. Well, I, I love, and I don't know how many hybrid book publishers have a forward by Ken Blanchard. Very few. And and, and but so you're not getting an advance to write this book. You, That's you're, right. You're paying them for their services, correct? To help you produce it, publish it, etc. And and I'm um, just looking at the ten chapters. I think I saw some of the manuscript of this before it got published. You did. I texted it to you. Yeah. And I think I, I maybe even gave you some feedback on, on some of the, because you were writing about Broad River Retail on this one. So we just get into some of the details accurate, I think, on some of that stuff, which was amazing. First time we were ever written about in a book. I love the, I got to go back to the title. I love the double meaning, the double entendre of the title, Finding Purpose at Work, which is at your literal workplace or in your workplace or in the work that you do or finding purpose at work in your life when you look back at your, on your life. That's uh, that that's really cool to have uh, in the, the way you unpack that second story. So I'm sure you can go back through your life and see the purpose points throughout your life that were at work that culminated. And, and it also just speaks to, you wouldn't have been put in this position to be this bamboo tree that's sprouting like a... Uh, uh, 10 feet a year, had you not had that incubation period that's that, right. that you really, you'd become a, a, a master of the game, a student, you know, you were a student first and you really became an expert, but you'd been putting it in, into practice at some really big companies in real life, practical ways. So I think that's a big part of your story that, that needs to be told along with this is this isn't like just fluff that you just came up with. You actually had practical application and then saw it work and you incubated it and really became a, a, a uh, a, a true expert at, at all of these things that we're synthesizing. And I do, I, I, I will say you are a really good storyteller. Maybe that's the Italian in you could be, <laughs> or your upbringing but, or the, or the school teacher DNA that you've got or that you wanted to be, but you, you're a great storyteller. I've, I've seen you speak multiple times and, um, and, and just listening to you here, you, you can, you can tell a really good story. So I uh, appreciate that. So tell us about this book, the, the 10 chapters here, uh, um, which are finding purpose, the road less traveled, who you are helping others become, leading with purpose, and now for plan A, purpose, mission, why, what good looks like, which is the title of your podcast now. We are all in this together uh, in one cup at a time, and you got a gift. You, you want to take us through the chapters of, of yeah, this? Yeah, I, I love to unpack it, and it's great because you, you really just walked through the first three chapters with what you just said, so the double meaning. So chapter one, finding purpose. Um, that's all about identifying what purpose is, right? Because mm -hmm. there's people use purpose and why interchangeably. I, I believe that they're two separate things. I believe that purpose is your reason for being and why is your reason for doing. We just talked about this with the memory makers of Broad River Retail, is that I could be clear about what my purpose is. You know, how am I supposed to show up today? What are the gifts, talents, abilities, skill sets that I have? What is it that I'm great at that others need? And how do I use that to make a difference right now? I can know very, very clearly what that is, but I could also not be motivated to do it. We all have down days. And so we need a why that's going to activate our purpose, 
right? And so a lot of times our why comes down to our who. Who are we doing this for? You know, am I doing this for, you know, my family? Am I doing this, you know, for my mentor? Am I doing this for, we, we actually just talked about this. Um, you know, Caitlin on your team came in here today and she said, you know, your talk uh, last uh, last week at Broad River, she says, I, there's been some things that I've been wanting to do. And then you started to talk about the Thieves of Purpose, which is the next book. And you started to talk about excuses, which you just challenged me on when I didn't want to go do an F3 workout on Sunday, but I went and did it anyway and overcame my own excuses. And she said, your talk motivated me to go and do these different things that I've been putting off that I know that I want to do. It gave me the 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 motivation, the inspiration to step into the purpose that I know that I was created for. And so a lot of times we need to have that motivation. We need to have that why, those who's in our lives. And so she was a who for me. I mean, there's going to be days where I'm going to be like, man, is this, did that talk make any difference? Did that book make any difference? And then someone like that comes up to you and says, hey, you made a difference. And that becomes the why to activate the purpose. Mm -hmm. So first, the first chapter really is all about that, finding what purpose is, identifying what your skill sets, gifts, talents, abilities are, how you use those every day to make a difference, and then understanding kind of the difference between purpose and why. The second chapter is the other meaning, which is finding purpose at work in your life. Mm -hmm. So I basically do a very, very short biography in chapter two because my, my um, and I named it The Road Less Traveled because of the feedback from the editor. So we just talked about hybrid publishers and how they give you feedback. So if you read chapter two, and if you listen to the first episode of, of what we just did together of my story and my journey, it's a very unconventional journey and story. And so I wrote my story in chapter two to connect the dots of here's everything that happened in my life and all the points where I recognized purpose at work in my life to lead me at where I'm at today. And the feedback that I got from the publisher when I sent them the manuscript literally said, the author's ability to obtain roles and positions with the size of companies he worked for without the education or experience to fulfill those roles won't resonate with the reader and we recommend that it's removed from the book. Wow. That's what they said. They want chapter two taken out. They want chapter two taken out. And you left it in. And I left it in and I said, you know what? I'm going to call it the road less traveled because- of that's exactly the point, is that the fact that I was able to step into these roles without a college education, without experience in marketing operations, human resources, and eventually in finance at Northwestern Mutual, the, the fact that I was able to do that was proof that if you look back and you see all the things that are happening in your life, there is a greater purpose that is being shaped for you to be able to step into the purpose that you were created for, mm. right? It, it emphasized the point that the chapter was supposed to make. So I left it in there. So that's what chapter two is all about. It's really about my, my life story, right? And then the third chapter, which you just talked about, is that I wanted people to recognize who are you that, helping? Who are that, you that's helping exactly right. Yeah. That 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 how do you identify where this shows up in your life? And so the easiest place for you to start for yourself of okay, well, how do I find purpose in my life? And then how do I find purpose at work at my life? Is well, first and foremost, look around you. Who are you helping others become? Both at work and at home. Who am I helping my wife become? Who am I helping my kids, Vera and Bennett, become? Who am I helping the people that I'm leading at work become? Who am I helping those that I speak to become? Who am I helping the reader of this book become? So if you want to both find purpose at work and find purpose at work in your life, ask yourself, well, what is the impact I'm having directly on those around me? And challenge yourself because once you start to do that, then you will start to ask some tough questions that will make you pause and step into those moments. I shared this with you at Broad River Retail. You know, my bride, Amy, she is a very, she's a much better writer than I am. She is a very, very talented writer. She was a writer and a journalist long before I was. We've got totes of newspapers in our basements with front page stories that Amy has written for, for newspapers for 10 years before she became a mom to our kids. And, um, she recently stepped back into writing. She just wrote a children's book, which will be published soon. It's an awesome children's book. And that's reignited this, this sense within her. But the reason that, that happened is we just went through a period of time where she felt her entire identity was tied to just the kids. Who am I helping the kids become? Mm -hmm. And she had this gift of writing that wasn't being used. And she says, you know, Davin, you're the purpose guy. And I don't really have a sense of purpose mm -hmm. other than being a mom. 
not to diminish moms out there, because if you read the first chapter, I elevate moms mm -hmm. in this book as one of the most purposeful things that you can be mm -hmm. and one of the most thankless things that you can be, but one of the most purposeful. And I said, well, well what is it you want to do? And we spent some time, I took some time off. We spent some time unpacking that. And I had to ask myself, who am I helping my wife become, mm -hmm. right? And so I, I, I wanted to pour into her to encourage her to write this children's book that had been on her heart and then connect her to the same literary agent that I have, Scott Miller, who, who right now is helping her get that published. And so... Um, you know, taking my own advice from that chapter. And so that's, that's why I wrote it is asking yourself, you know, who are you helping others become? Well, I love the Socratic method of asking yourself these deep philosophical reflexive, but simple, simple, but profound questions to helping you find your own purpose in your own way. And so that you don't just waste years of your life, just, just running the rat race or just treading water, just doing without purpose, without meaning applied to it. Okay. So uh, you're, you're on a roll. So chapter four, leading with purpose. Right. So now, so now once we kind of covered the individual aspect of this, I, I have a passion for leadership. So I needed to find a way to transition into, well, how do you lead with that? What does that look like to, to lead with that? And so I started to talk about obviously different, well, first of all, what is a leader, right? What are the four qu great qualities of a leader? And I unpacked that. And then I start talking about situational leadership and Ken's work and mm -hmm. servant leadership, which is also Ken's work. He wrote the book, The Servant Leader. Um, and then, you know, I realized, well, not everyone, I mean, everyone is a leader. And the reason I say that is at the end of the day, leadership is, is influence and we all have influence. The question is, do you have good influence or bad influence? Are you a good leader or are you a bad leader? Right. I mean, we, I talk about this with my kids and, and, and the influence that they have in school and who they're allowing to influence their life. So we all can be leaders, good or bad. The question is, are you, are you a good or bad one? And so then that made me answer, okay, well, not everyone's in a leadership role. You've got some people who are entrepreneurs. In fact, we've got more people growing into entrepreneurship than ever before in any time in the history of humanity. So what does it look like to be a, a servant entrepreneur, a purposeful entrepreneur? And so, you know, I cover, cover that aspect in that. And, and then I felt, you know, um, going from chapter four to five was a little clunky for me initially. And I almost, I almost flipped this and then I didn't because there's a lot of people that are like, okay, well, I know my purpose. I know what I want to step into, but maybe I'm not in the right role or function. Maybe I'm not in the right company. Maybe I'm not in a leadership role. Well, what do I do? And, ha and how, do I, how do I take that leap? Not necessarily take that leap as in quitting your job. How do you take the leap from who you are to who you can be? Whether that's in your current job or as an entrepreneur, whatever the case is, what does that gap look like? And I wanted to help people close the gap. And so that's really what chapter five is all about, is taking that leap. And then there's a lot of people that think that like, once they take the leap, boom, just everything happens. We live in an I want it now, an immediate gratification society. And the reality is, that's not the case. In fact, I was just on a podcast last week where someone was talking about wanting to step into speaking and writing and all these different things. And they had just started a couple of years ago and they're wondering why it's not happening for them. And then I had to unpack my story and say, hey, this, this journey started for me back in 2012 when I spoke to leaders at CVS 11 years ago. And back then, I had no desire to become an author or a speaker or any of those things. I just focused on stepping into my purpose. And the byproduct of that was becoming an author and speaker and all those things. So there's a journey here. And I think so many people are focused on who they want to become and what they want to do rather than focusing on who they need to be right now. Yeah. And so I really wanted to unpack how do you find joy in the journey of what you're, what you're in right now? Focus on who you need to be, not on what you need to do. Yeah, yeah right now. And that's, and now for plan A, you don't hear about plan A that much. No, okay. that, that, right. Plan A is, and here's the reason for, I, I call it a now for plan A is because one of the thieves of purpose, fear, I talked about that at, at the memory makers, fear will stop you back from, from stepping into plan A. We always have to have a plan B or a plan C. And the reality is, is when we start making plan B's and C's and I'm, there's, there's due diligence in having backup plans. This, I'm not, I'm not anti-backup plan. You should have a backup plan. But the reality is, is that most people's backup plan is their plan A. They just don't say it, mm -hmm. right? And so, the, and now for plan A was actually inspired because of my friend, Dennis Mosley Williams, who I wrote in this book. So kind of to tie this together to the Purpose Summit, which we talked about, and we'll talk about again in the previous episode. When we decided to do the Purpose Summit in 2019, there was no plan B. There was only plan A. And Dennis Mosley Williams spoke at the Purpose Summit. And then afterwards, he, he, he sends me a text message from his plane. And he says, I can't tell you how transformative 
that was, I feel like I just stepped into the very first TED Talk ever, right? And that the summit's going to be something wow. bigger than you could possibly yeah. imagine. And I was the very first one. So thank you for stepping into your plan A and not not being fearful, not having a backup plan, love just it. stepping into that's it. That's great. And that, so I, I named that chapter very purposefully as a nod to him. Yeah. And that's what that is. So that's the first half of the book. That's the first half of the book. All right. So the second half, you're going back to the basics, it seems like. Yeah. Which you unpacked, you know, the difference between purpose and why, but you infused mission here. So that's right. purpose, mission, why. And I hear a lot of people say be on mission. So what, that's right. what, talk to us about this chapter. Yeah. So after we got through the first half and I've kind of laid out for the case for this and kind of how I feel like, okay, I'm kind of making an assumption that if you read the first half of this book, now you need some application. Mm. Now you need to understand if you're bought in on everything that I just talked about, what does this look like? And so what I wanted to do was first delineate between purpose, mission, and why, because those are different things, right? Purpose your, 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 is, is your reason for being. It's what you mm -hmm. do. Uh, mission is the impact of your purpose. What is the impact that you want to see happen okay. by activating your purpose? And then why? What's your motivation mm -hmm. for it? So uh, one of the examples I love to use recently is WD-40. Mm -hmm. And not WD-40 as a company. And I talk about them and their culture, and they're amazing all the time. But WD-40, the actual product. So my son, Bennett, my son loves to go fast. His favorite uh, superhero is the Flash because he loves to go, go fast. And he was on his bike. And his bike wasn't going as fast as he wanted it to go because the gears were just all grimy. Mm -hmm. So I went and got a can of WD-40. Well, what's the purpose of WD-40? Well, it's a lubricant. And it's got 101 different purposes. And there's a whole book that you can read on that. But I applied it. And the purpose was to clean the gears. But the mission was so that the bike would go fast, so that my son Bennett can go fast. Mm -hmm. So it's very clear what the purpose of the product was, which was to lubricate the gears. But the mission was so that the bike can go fast. And so there's a difference between purpose and mission. And then I apply this to companies. I tell stories of some companies as an example of the difference between your purpose and mission. And then your why, what's your motivating factor? For me, it was my son Bennett, right? And so what's your why? What's your persona as a company? When you start talking about your purpose as a company, when you start talking about your mission as a company, well, what's the face of that? What's the why? Can you, can you assign a persona to the mission to humanize it so that people can 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 empathize with that and, and 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 motivate them to do that. And so that's what chapter six is all about. Yeah. And then I needed to start to tell stories to back that up. What so good, what good looks what like. What good looks like. This is this is what good looks like. And so what had happened in stepping in and being the Stanley Tucci of purpose, right? I had saw companies that were doing this and saying this is what good looks like and this is what good looks like and this is what good looks like. And, and, and talked about emphasizing people over process and purpose and people over process and performance. And then my favorite section in this book is Stop. balcony people, balcony right? Balcony people. And, and balcony people is a nod to the memory makers at Broad River Retail and what you're doing because I felt it was such an, a great, a, so good, so, so good. It was so, so good. Such a great example of what this looks like and what you guys are doing at Broad River every day. But, but what is a balcony person? So a balcony person is, and, and, and I didn't write the book balcony people, but here's the thing is that, you know, there's a biblical reference to this about being surrounded by a cloud of witnesses of people watching us and cheering us on and running the race that is set forth before us. And so there's a biblical reference to it, but then there's also a very applicable piece of this, of that there are people who are cheering you on, who are watching from the grandstands and watching you every single day kind of step into the fullness of who you are. And whether you know it or not, they're cheering you on. And so what I loved is that one of the things that captivated me about the memory makers as I was watching you um, live out your purpose at Broadway Retail and watching the memory makers live out their purpose is it was the absolute epitome of balcony people. It was almost like, hey, today, you know, Right, Caitlin might be in the arena, right? Mm -hmm. But the rest of the memory makers are in the balcony cheering her on. Or today, love, yeah. Manny might be in the arena, but the rest of the maker, the memory makers are in the balcony cheering her on. And so there was this, I was literally watching the memory makers at Broad River Retail cheer each other on through LinkedIn, celebrating you know their accomplishments together of, of, of who they were, the difference they were a maker. And so I was, th th this piece here is a challenge to, well, number one, who are the balcony people in your life? Because going back to your why, going back to chapter six, if you need, if you're losing your motivation to step into your purpose, who are the balcony people that are cheering you on? Because we all need them, yeah, right? 
And then are, who are you a balcony person for, yeah. right? Who, who is it that you need to cheer on in your life? And you guys exemplify well, that well, so, thank so you well. For this, thank you for, that's, that's a great metaphor. I love it. I love it. Okay. Chapter eight, we are all in this together. Was that inspired from the pandemic? A hundred percent. Okay. This chapter, I had not planned it. Um, but this is this this chapter was inspired because this was in the heat. I mean, in the heat of the pandemic, and everyone was losing a sense of purpose. I mean, it was just it, it almost had seemed like you know two weeks to turn into four, four weeks to turn into months. We couldn't see any end in sight. But there was again trying to find purpose at work. So I'm 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 looking at this and going, okay. There's got to be purpose in all of this. And what does that look like? And our mutual friend, Zach Mercurio, had written an article, uh, Finding Purpose in a Pandemic, which is exactly what I was trying to get after. Like, how do you find purpose even in a pandemic? Mm -hmm. And he had written this article on LinkedIn, and I just thought it was so, so good. And so I had asked him, I said, do you mind if I include your article in a chapter in this book? And he said, I'd be honored. And so I include that article in there. But then that inspired me to look even beyond his perspective of finding purpose in the pandemic. And... I said, if you look, and this is, this is, this is, I can't emphasize this enough because I feel like this is, this has since been lost. And this is something the pandemic should have taught us that clearly didn't stick. But if you think about it, you know, what do, uh, GM, Ford, Stellantis, Chrysler, all these companies, all these automotive companies, you know, what do they make? Well, they make cars, but during the pandemic, what were they making? Um, uh, oxygen ventilators. ventilators they're making ventilators yeah. and so the reality is is their purpose wasn't to make cars their purpose was to make whatever society needed at that point and mm -hmm. society didn't need cars mm -hmm. at that point there's a time when society needs cars so they make cars but during this point they started to make they, what were they great at going back to what purposes what are you great at and where's the need what they were great at was manufacturing at scale yeah. So they were great at manufacturing at scale, but there wasn't a need for cars because no one was going anywhere. So what needed to be manufactured at scale? Ventilators. So all the manufacturing companies started making ventilators, right? And then if you look at you know uh, clothing companies, not a lot of people need to buy new clothes because no one was shopping. But what did we need? Masks. And so all the clothing companies started to make masks, mm -hmm. right? Levi started making masks. And then, you know, my, probably my favorite in this is all the alcohol companies, right? All the bars were closed. So no one needed to make alcohol. So, but what do we need? Sanitizer. sanitizer. Yeah. And to this day, I could still smell sanitizer that smells like tequila. It's yeah. gross, right? It's yeah. sticky yeah. and grimy. It did its job, but it wasn't like the best sanitizer. But what had happened was in the middle of a pandemic, all of these companies that once prioritized profit over everything else, prioritize their purpose. And they said, what are we good at? Where's the need? How can we step in? Mm -hmm. And it was such a great example of saying, hey, we're all in this together. Right. It doesn't matter what we make or who we do. We can make a difference together. And, and I think like that hadn't happened ex pro for a long time, probably in almost 20 years, because it happened like after 9-11. Right. We were, the company had this great, uh, you, 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 we all came together, right? As, right. as, as uh, the union was brought together. And I really felt like, cause you would see all the commercials, even songs were all in this together. Matter of fact, our word of the year in 2021 became two words, just like there were two colors of the year from Pantone that year. It became forward together. Right. Yeah. So bringing the heritage of United, which was our word of the year in 2020. So we are all in this together. And Zach always talks about it. I think he talks about connecting purpose. If you really want to find purpose or, or the why, put a human being at the end of the supply yeah, chain, sure. at the end of the supply chain. Right. And so it, that's where you can find the mattering and, and the purpose is. So for GM or Ford, when they put the human being of the lives that they were saved at the end of the supply chain, that's who they were doing it for. Exactly. You know, so it was the human being is where they found the purpose. That which, becomes the why that's to right. activate the purpose. That's right. Okay, that's great. So chapter nine, I don't know what this one's about. One cup at a time. Is yeah. That, is that coffee? So it is coffee. I love coffee. You know that I love yeah. coffee. Um, and, and what inspired this is I wanted to bring this back because I think I, I had, I had started to focus a lot organizationally. Chapter six, seven, and eight were very, uh, organizationally focused. And I wanted to bring this back to the reader and I wanted to recognize that purpose is not one singular grandiose thing. It can be, right? Um, we, we could say that we all have one higher purpose for our lives and, and we do and we can have that conversation. But I wanted to focus on purpose being plural and momentary. And so it, we, we often, I, I drink copious amounts of coffee and I often don't stop to taste it. 
right? I don't actually, I used to love actually not multitasking and just sitting and tasting, you know, the, the fullness, the body, the acidity, and really enjoying the coffee rather than just consuming the coffee. Mm -hmm. And so in many ways, I feel like we go through life like that. We go through life and we go through moments like cups of coffee and we don't stop mm -hmm. to actually focus on what's happening in the moment, to find purpose in the moment of what's happening right in front of you. And there were some key moments, key purpose points, if you will, that I wanted to hone in on that as I look back and said, wow, like these key moments here were really, really good cups of coffee that ended up having a profound impact in my life. And so I talked about those and, 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 and really emphasize and, and the nod one cup at a time isn't just coffee. There's, there's different cups. One of my favorite stories in this chapter is my daughter had bought me, um, she had went to one of those Santa shops at her school when she was a kid and she still is a kid, but she was a really younger kid. And she had bought me uh, a Batman coffee mug. I'm not a Batman fan. And so when I opened it Christmas morning, uh, I was like, okay, this is cute. Probably cost her $2 at the Santa mm -hmm. store. And she said, Daddy, I got you that because I know you love coffee and you're my super daddy. Oh. And I was like, oh, like my heart like melted. Mm -hmm. And that cup became my favorite cup. And one day my wife was cleaning the kitchen and the cup got knocked off the counter and shattered into a million pieces on the floor. And my daughter just started weeping. Was that my daddy's favorite mug? And just like losing it. And so I could have just said, it's okay, we'll buy another one, right? I could have, it was, I could, I'm sure I can find it on Amazon or whatever the case is. Um, but I stopped. I paused in the moment and said, is there a greater purpose in this moment, right? Using my own words here. And my daughter loved putting puzzles together. And I said, Vera, you love, you love puzzles, right? I'm like, what if we put this mug back together together? And we spent like the next three hours with endless rolls of, of scotch tape, putting together the Batman mug back together piece by piece, piece by piece and restoring it wow. into, I mean, it was in a ton of pieces. And that mug today sits on my desk with pens in it because I can't drink out of it yeah. anymore, but it still serves a purpose as both a reminder and has a renewed sense of purpose. That's wonderful. Um, one of my favorite, favorite stories in that chapter. And then chapter 10, the end of the book, You've Got a Gift. Um, this was a dedication to my friend, Daniel P. Marsh, Dan Marsh, he, he was a dear friend that we lost during COVID and, mm. and I had, uh, I wanted to end this book in COVID, uh, to get the book out and I wanted to end it because he was such a tremendous person. He would constantly, he was an, a consumer of all, I shouldn't say that, not a consumer. He was a gatherer and an absorber of all kinds of information. He was a sponge of information. And just like any sponge, the purpose of a sponge is you soak it all in and then you squeeze it out, right? It's not meant to retain the water it holds. It's meant to use it for a great purpose. And he would do that anywhere he would went. Anytime people were needed a bit of information, he was like, oh, have you read this book? Oh, have you found this research? Oh, let me send you that. And he was just a conduit of information. And one of the things he always used to say to me, he was like a real life Robert De Niro. If you've ever seen Analyze This, he would point to me with his finger and he would say, you've got a gift. You, you've got a gift. You, you need to take this writing, this speaking, and you need to do something with it. And he would constantly inspire me mm. that I had this purpose that I need to elevate on a higher level that I, that I wasn't using to its fullness. And so I dedicated that chapter because I wanted the reader to recognize after writing this that wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, you've got a gift. There is a purpose inside you that you are sitting on that needs to be elevated to make the difference that you were created for. That is a, uh, that is so true of everyone, right? And that, that does stress some people out because they're like, what is my gift? What is my gift? Um, you know, that can be stressful, but I would encourage them to read this book and it may be illuminating for them to find the answer. Do you want to direct them anywhere? It says learn more at davinsalvanio.com. Yes. Where, where would you like someone who wants to pick up a copy of this book? Where can they go? Yeah, well, you can certainly go to davinsalvanio.com. The book is there and there's tons of resources. Uh, all of our podcasts are there. The episodes that, that you and I have had yeah. together are on davinsalvanio.com. For uh, Amazon people out there, it's available at Amazon. It's available at Barnes & Noble. Um, so pretty much anywhere books are sold, but, uh, yeah, davinsalvanio.com is a great resource. Amazon's a great resource. Barnes and Noble is a great resource. Now, Davin, just a couple more things here and we'll conclude this episode. I like to say purpose begins with identity. I've had one time someone challenged me and said, I thought identity begins with purpose. What, what, and, and identity, you know, connects the who, right? Or the yeah. GPS of where you want to go. And you know, so, um, or who you want to become, I, I should say. What do you think about that statement? Purpose begins with identity. 
you know, I, and, and I believe that it's a chicken and egg conversation, right? You can go either way. But I, but I would say purpose begins with identity makes sense. Because if you think about that, I, and I shared this I, I, at, at, the, at the talk that we did with the memory makers, my title slide uh, for many of my talks usually has a picture of me and it usually says, you know, best-selling author, inspirational speaker, founder of Purpose Point, all these things. And I changed it to say husband, father, author, speaker. I could add worship leader there. I could ask all these things. So if I were to ask what my identity is first, okay, I have an identity as a husband. I have an identity as a father. I have an identity as an author. I have an identity as a speaker. And so I think you should focus on your identity first because that will help you focus on what purpose you're supposed to step into mm-hmm. in that moment. Got it. And I don't think we've ever done a book recap like we've just done. If someone wants the audio book for finding purpose, <laughs> <laughs> Finding purpose at work. Where would they go, Gavin? All right. So, truth be told, I have I I've been a holdout on audiobooks, and I keep on getting challenged because listen, I I love reading books now, and I just feel like when you listen to audiobooks, like eighty percent of what you heard is lost. And so, sitting here in this studio today, I have been challenged and convicted, and will be back in this studio to record an audio in this studio in here this in studio. Charlotte, wow. North Carolina. Okay to record an audio book of Finding Purpose at Work uh, on my next trip here to Charlotte, and that might be in a couple months. And so depending on when this podcast is released, that might be out by now, and so then you can search for it, or it might be coming soon. I love it. Well, with that, Davin, we like to say, go make a happy memory today. Go make today one of your best memories. Davin, thank you so much. Will you come back again so we can talk about your second upcoming book and the talk that you gave on the Thieves of Purpose? Absolutely. I would love to. Thanks so much for joining us here at Stories from the River. Thanks for listening to Stories from the River. To check out more episodes, visit storiesfromtheriver.com. Join us again next week and remember to like, rate, and subscribe to the podcast.